Welcome to Becoming Parents podcast. I'm the host, Jennifer Campbell. I am so excited today. I have Jacqueline Downs on. Jacqueline, how are you? I am wonderful and I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. I love this. I want you to jump into your story. Usually I talk about your parenting journey first, but I just jump in and start talking about your journey in general because you're doing some amazing things that I really want to shout out. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I sort of fell into a passion for uh, birth work uh, when I was, I guess, in 2002. So I was in my my 20s and somebody, I was talking about doulas. Not too many people had known what a doula was, much less why would they want to pay $300 at the time uh, for a total stranger to attend their birth, right? Um but uh, I was talking about, there was a doula program when I was living in San Diego at UCSD hospital. And somebody gave me a book called Immaculate Deception by Suzanne Arms. And uh, as I say, in the book that I wrote, I had never considered myself much of an advocate for anything except for bicycling. And so this just, it was, it opened up a whole new world. I'd never even thought about because I was in my twenties. I myself and my friends weren't anywhere close to having children. Um, so I became a doula through the UCSD heart and hands program. And I was talking to my dad on the phone back in Pennsylvania. And he was like, well, you know, I know like the world's best midwife, uh, maybe a tiny little bit of an overstatement, but she is very world renowned. Um, and she's friends with Ina Mae Gaskin, who is the grandmother of midwifery. Um, so I had sworn off Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Amish country, cause I grew up there and I didn't like it. But I moved home from San Diego to apprentice with her and um, do attend uh, Amish and Mennonite home births. And so um, I, you know, did prenatals and herbs and uh, postpartum checkups and, you know, tending to miscarriages and attended Mm -hmm. over 100 births there. But it was during that time that, uh, again, I was in my late 20s nobody was talking about fertility challenges, at least not in my circles, right? And I had no idea how common and prevalent they were until I worked with this midwife. And so these, she had clients coming in pretty regularly, either because they never got pregnant or they kept having miscarriages. And um, she was more nutritionally based than a lot of other midwives out there. Um, but still, you know, she was just, she had such a busy practice. She couldn't really focus too much on fertility. So, um, that my dad was a nutritional biochemist. And so I grew up just being aware of nutrition, being aware that there was nutrition outside of the box that was being fed to us as far as, you know, eat 12 servings of carbs a day and uh, eat low fat foods and all of this. And so my dad was always ahead of his time. Um, He, I say in my book that it's pretty certain that I was the only kid in junior high that knew what a probiotic was. (laughs) Did anybody know what that was back then? Yeah. Then during the the fat phobia of the nineties and early two thousands, like my dad was like, no, there's good fats and there's bad fats. And so he I trusted what he said and, and, you know, he was always considered a quack, but years later, like, you know, then the Adkins diet became big and people were like, oh, carbs do make you that, you know? So, um, that, so I had gotten, uh, I wanted to get a nutrition degree, but none of the schools in my state offered the kind of nutrition that I wanted to learn. They were all teaching the antiquated and, you know, regurgitated old information Um, So I got a psychology degree instead, but during that education, I learned about psycho neuroimmunology, which is basically psycho brain, neuro brain um, behavior and immunology. And so how our thoughts and our brain chemicals and our immune system are all interconnected and also uh, affect our hormones. And so it's like, it was the scientific basis for why we are holistic beings, basically. Um, So I ended up going and getting a a master's in holistic nutrition and a certification as a health coach um, and really wanting to still work with women in the reproductive years. So I started a doula collective um, as as a birth doula and uh, people still, it was, this was about maybe 2007 or eight. 
And people were starting to know there were more doulas in my town. When I first moved back in 2003, there were like three of us. And then come 2007, 2008, there were, no, maybe it was later than that. Yeah, it was around 2008, 2009. There were more doulas in our town. There was a handful. So I started a on-call collective and we would give workshops on breastfeeding and cloth diapering and we would, you know, attend births. Um, but I still, but that wasn't, I wasn't making a whole lot of money. And then I ended up going to Texas to be with my now husband um, and then ended up having kids. And uh, But it is because of my education and my attendance at home births that I knew that I did not want to have a traumatic birth. So, mm -hmm. so many doulas become doulas because they had a very traumatic birth experience of their own. And they want to make sure that women are empowered and, and have a blissful birth. But it sort of happened that I fell into birth work. And so I knew the type of birth I wanted to have. So of course I had my midwife that I apprenticed with as my midwife. And I went on to have both of my daughters at home lovely pregnancies, beautiful births. Um, and so I'm, I'm very, very grateful about that. Um, so then once I had my children, I wanted to kind of, you know, for the, after my first was born, um, I guess it was, she was maybe about a year or two. Um, and I wanted to start doing, working more. Um, so I got a job as a research assistant for a naturopath in the area. And mm -hmm. I had been familiar with epigenetics through my education, but it wasn't anything really in depth because it wasn't really uh, a very advanced field when I was getting my degree and my, my certifications. Um, so I got hired to research MTHFR. And if, for people that don't know, that is a, a gene that makes an enzyme of the same name that is involved with processing folate folic acid, folate, methylfolate. Um, and a lot of people blame their inability to detoxify and uh, the reason they blame all their miscarriages on MTHFR. And while that is a very important gene and I'm not discounting the importance of it, it is one gene out of about 23,000. No gene stands alone. And it is not the reason that we can't blame all of our problems on MTHFR. There's so many other genes upstream and downstream and there's other factors um, and a lot of environmental factors as well. So taking my um, research education, which started at MTHFR and expanded into the methylation pathway and then other pathways intersecting these pathways and um, learning about so much more, I took my previous career in birth work along with my nutritional background and coupled it with the genetic research that I had been doing or the epigenetic research. And I wrote the book that I gave birth to in 2023 called Enhancing mm -hmm. Fertility Through Functional Medicine Using Nutrigenomics to Solve Unexplained Infertility. And that is an academically published book by Taylor and Francis. So um, even though I don't have a PhD, it is still, I still feel like it gives me street cred because it is an academic publication. I'm so proud of you. I mean, oh, thank you. Uh, the work that you've done, how I, I, and I think it's fascinating, just like, you know, how the things line up. Your dad's saying, oh, by the way, I happen to know this midwife, like, mm -hmm. you know, knowing now, if you knew then what you know now, or you took that opportunity where those of us in birth work would have been like, left leg, take my left. I want to apprentice with that midwife, you know, mm -hmm. um, how, just how cool things were that lined up and that, you know, it's always fascinating to me when women get into birth work prior to their own births, because they, I think that's such a different source of passion and empowerment that happens in those situations. That's so fascinating to me because, you know, I had a birth and that's what got me into birth work. I think a lot of, and you're right. You mentioned that a lot of doulas get into it because their first birth was traumatic. And I a hundred percent agree. And, you know, I had a traumatic situation, but a very positive birth, but I knew I didn't have to feel uneducated, unsupported and alone. And that part of it, I think it went smashing really well and very positive. And I could make it even better you know, with that supportive doulas. So 
I love that. I love how you started out and that difference in your story and that how much that affected your, like, I know how I want to birth my babies. Yes. Yes. And then that passion carrying over into me, helping other women be able to experience that blissful birth where they're in control and they yeah. are aware of all of their options, making informed choices. So it's not like, oh, you want to have your baby at a hospital or, oh, you want an epidural. No, I just, I gave my clients education so that they can make informed choices. And right. I fully supported my clients depending on, or, or based on, sorry, I fully supported my clients with whatever choice they made, knowing that they had the proper amount of education behind it. And that's what, that's what I tell my clients now. Like, I, I don't care what decision that you make. And it's not that I don't care about you or I don't care about the outcome. Like if you're educated, no, there's no right and wrong or good and bad. It's mm -hmm. all about you and what you want and what fits your birth and your family. And that doesn't affect me at all. But you being educated about it, that's the important thing. That's, yes. I want you to make those choices, knowing that there are options and then yes. deciding what you want. And then we get it. Then we 100%, do that thing. Yes. And that yes. is why I wrote my book um, on fertility, because so many people are told, well, you're having fertility problems. You need IVF or you need some sort of assisted reproductive technology. And that should not ever be somebody's first choice, unless of course they have some sort of structural anomaly and they know that the natural process won't be right. But our hormones are, are the messengers. And so we have to find out why the hormones are not in a place to be receptive to conceive and sustain a pregnancy. And so right. by just giving, administering artificial synthetic hormones to force them into the appropriate levels to achieve pregnancy is not getting to the root of the problem. And that is why, and I have a statistic in my book that children born as the result of ART have a higher incidence of being special needs or having special needs, um, or just more, um, autism, more allergen, more allergenic, that kind of stuff. And so if we can get to the root of the problem and, and you can be educated on all of the possible reasons or many of the possible reasons that your body would feel it needs to temporarily halt mating ability, that is only going to make our outcomes better for ourselves and our pregnancies and our births and our postpartum period, but also enhance the potential for our children to be healthier and more robust. I went through infertility in like 1990 and a half to 19. My daughter was born in 1992 in April and I went through 10 months of infertility. So I was max on Clomid, max on Provera, wow. went through the seven day surgeries, you know, the flushing of the fallopian tubes, the mm -hmm. cervical, uh, the whole thing. It was horrible, awful. I felt like a, a different person. And I hit the point where the doctor was like, the next step for you is IVF. And I went, nope. That's not my path mm -hmm. and crazy. Cause I was like 20 years old at the time I was married. It was planned, but I was so young. Right. Wow. And he said, you know, I said, that's not my path. I need to get weaned off medication. I'll do foster care. I'll adopt whatever. And, you know, they do your blood work as they're weaning you off everything. And he was this short little Asian guy, very introverted. And I went, was in his office one day and he hugged me which wow. was very strange. And he yeah. said, you're pregnant and I don't know how, oh, like wow. you did oh, not get, bumps. you did not get pregnant on our schedule. You randomly release an egg. I don't know if you'll get pregnant after this. You, I would say from your hormones, you will have a very high rate of miscarriage mm -hmm. and this could be a challenging pregnancy. Wow. It was a very challenging pregnancy. I got pregnant seven times, but I lost three of those, but I had mm -hmm. four. Um, and I ended up with a hysterectomy at 33. I mean, like I was your demographic, right? And back then there were no other options, which was so hard. And I feel so grateful that I gave birth four times yeah. because even when I had my hysterectomy, the doctor was like, I don't know how you carried babies to term with your records and all of that stuff, but I did. Um, and I just think it's fascinating. So my daughter, who's now 32, because she was born in 92, probably will will never have children and will not go through the process. But 
for her, for the medical professionals to figure out what's going on. She's gone through almost all of those same day surgeries, Mm -hmm. um, all kinds of different birth control options. And she finally said, and I would have thought like 16 to 25 years after I went through it, you know, from the time she was like 16 to 25, they would have come up with something different, something better, right. something more. Yeah. And yet she was put in the same funnel that I was put in and wow. finally said no more and went off of everything and has managed, managed all of her symptoms through diet, through exercise, through supplement. So I can't tell you how much I appreciate personally, very personally, the fact that when you were assistant to a midwife and you were seeing these miscarriages, this, these infertility issues, because no one's talking about it and there are no other options. And so like it very personally strikes a, a passionate chord in me that this is that through all of the weaving in of your story, that this is where you specialize. It means a lot to me. So thank you for that. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. That, that really is very heartening. And at, at times I wasn't sure I was like, Oh, am I like completely switching careers? You know, mm. I, you know, I was in birth work and, and nutrition, but this, um, because nutrition is so, in, it's so intertwined with fertility and pregnancy and the postpartum period that, everything just came full circle. It was, it, it really, you can't have one without the other. That yes, that's true. But I think we kind of all get into our, like, you know, I did birth work for 12 years and I was assistant to a home birth midwifery practice also for seven of those 12 years off and on. And we get very tunnel vision in that. Right. And, um, it's hard to do all the things in all of the ways. And, um, I still, so I'm still, like you could have gone in many directions, but this, this was such a great direction. You have programs that I'm so excited about. You have your book, which is amazing. That's amazing. But you have a lot of other, tell me about how you, the direction you want to take this. Cause you're not a doula anymore. Are you in Texas? No, I'm in Pennsylvania. Oh, you are, in, you stay, you are in Pennsylvania again. Yeah, I stayed. I mean, it's, it's sort of home base. I've, I've yeah. moved around, but it's home base. So this okay. is where I am for now. Um, so tell me what it looks like now. You did the book. Are you still a doula? Do you still have the doula cooperative that you did? What are you doing now? And okay. what are the programs moving forward? Because I know you have them. Okay. So I have passed on the baton for birth work. Mm -hmm. I, I was fully immersed in it. I have, um, yoga certifications for prenatal and postpartum yoga instruction. I, um, took the certification course for uh, placenta encapsulation, you know, doula. <laughs> you did every single I one. Did. I did. I did. I was very passionate about yeah. helping women. Um, but then I realized that with what I know and the knowledge that I have regarding fertility and nutrition and genetics, that this was where I could be most useful because now there are plenty of way, uh, doulas out there to support women during pregnancy and birth. And so uh, I, I shifted and um, I did get my book published. And it's, it is, while it is written for both the lay person that has done a lot of their own education and also for practitioners to use as a guidebook. Um, it is really discussing common but lesser known root causes of oxidative stress and inflammation that are at the oh. root of all chronic conditions. So one of my beta readers said, I'm actually going to recommend this to my brother because he has X, Y, and Z going on and it's not related to fertility, but there's so many factors that affect our health. So I have chapters on oxalates and histamine intolerance and detoxification and fatty acid utilization and iron dysregulation. And so these aren't only relevant to fertility. They are relevant to human health and building health uh, from a foundational level and identifying you know, the, the, the things that are causing the problems. Uh, so with that, I also do genetic interpretations. So I do see clients, about 50% of my clients are coming to me for fertility challenges and fertility okay. support. Um, but the other 50% are 
rant like children, you know, 60 year old men with gout or whatever, you know, so I, I have the whole gamut. Um, and, and that's where genetics really shines because um, the software that I use, my colleague, uh, the naturopath that I started researching for about 10 years ago, um, he has, his software is only for practitioners to use, but he has optometrists, he has chiropractors, he has acupuncturists, he has uh, a dentist actually, like a lot of different types of practitioners use this because oxidative stress and inflammation are the cause of so many issues chronic conditions. And so you can okay. look at your genes and you can see um, what your predispositions are and how to better support yourself going forward. And oxidative stress is about an low antioxidant levels, correct? Yes. Yeah. It's okay. the reason why we need antioxidants. Okay. What are some of the, it's, I love that, you know, a, someone was reading it and was like, oh, I'm going to send this to to a guy that's not in this demographic and that it was so fitting because I think that oxidative stress and inflammation, I, I don't know that anyone in the U S doesn't have it. Yes. And actually we do need oxidative stress because without it, we wouldn't be able to fight off pathogens, but it's, it's that okay. Goldilocks zone. And with all of the toxins we're exposed to and all of the stressors, that we have nowadays compared to as our bodies were evolving, um, our bodies just weren't designed to deal with this much and encounter this much and create this much oxidative stress. And so we really have to be proactive this day and age to make sure that our detoxification pathways are not overburdened and that we have enough antioxidants. And, and so with your knowing what your genes say, we can know if you are predisposed to not producing enough to begin with, or mm. if you have so much inflammation, you're just burning through your antioxidants and that's why they're low because, and then, so we can figure out where the inflammation is coming from and also how much and, and which, and by what method to raise the antioxidants in the body as well. So everybody's going to have a different route, right? You could have five people with, um, diabetes or miscarriages, but five different causes. And so there's, okay. and everybody's genetic profile is different. So that's why I really, really love personalized genetics, not the run of the mill automated can response genetic interpretations that are out there on the market. They're just, and I literally just made a post about this on Instagram this morning where they're just saying, Oh, you have this gene variant. So we're going to plug in this information about it but they don't know your previous exposures, your previous diagnoses, your levels of stress, like mm. um, the supplements and the dietary habits that you have. And so they're just, they're just, again, putting a blanket canned response in for whatever gene you have, whereas it's not super personalized. So when I do genetic interpretations, I have people fill out a meticulous intake form and I am making, uh, I'm emailing them as I'm going through their genome saying, oh, hey, you know, do you have, does your, and I just said this in the post this morning, do you have, um, does your family have uh, gallbladder issues? Do you have a history of gallbladder issues in your family? Uh, did you get premature gray hair? Um, and then okay. also like, do your floats or do your stools float or do they sink? Are you seeing undigested food? Are they greasy? Are you leaving skid marks? Like I, I ask more about your poop than probably anybody else ever has, but I can tell a lot about what's going on. And so that just helps me to better personalize the genetic interpretation. I, one of my questions was, uh, what is it like to go through the genetic testing? And I, I might not remember it. Well, I want to make the connection to infertility too. The um, oxidative stress and inflammation and infertility. Okay. So you can go in any direction you want. Okay. So our eggs and sperm take the first hit when it comes to oxidative stress, because so oxidative stress can be caused from physical stress, you know, over-exercising or, you know, whatever. Um, also from mental and emotional stress, but also environmental stress. So mm -hmm. all of these things impact our health and put our body in a state of stress and so the body in its protective mechanism says, well, we need to deal with this stress. Obviously now's not a good time to make a baby. So we're going to rob from Peter to pay Paul. So we're going to oh. rob our fertility ability in order to deal with the stress. 
And so that's why our fertility is usually the first thing to be compromised when we have a high level of toxins or stress or what have you, or our, you know, over-exercising, marathon training, that kind of stuff. And it's not even marathons though. Some people just are doing CrossFit too many days or going too hard. So everybody has a different level of exercise capacity to, again, it's that Goldilocks zone. We need to be moving our bodies, but how much and for how long and how often varies for everybody that looks different for everybody. Wow. Okay. I, now I understand that. What's it like to go through the testing other than talking about poop, which is one of my favorite things too. So we can talk (laughs) about poop. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the, a lot of people just focus on MTHFR. Right. And that's, that's the, that's the hot buzzword. And I almost titled my book MTHFR as a gateway gene, because it is the first gene that people often hear about. And it opens them up to the concept that our genes affect our health and that our health uh, affects our genetic expression. And uh, so rather MTHFR is at the top of this pyramid that I use. And so MTHFR is a rebuilding, regenerating, repairing nutrient. That's why you need it when you're pregnant. But if you have a lot of inflammation and oxidative stress, basically your building's on fire somewhere, uh, you want to call in the fire department, not the reconstruction crew, right? The folate is a rebuilding, regenerating nutrient. So we need to, this is oftentimes why methylated supplements often backfire for people because they didn't address the foundational layers. And so uh, looking Looking at things that cause the inflammation and are causing the fire, which I talk about in my book, or if you get a genetic interpretation through me, that is always the first thing I'm going to be looking at your antioxidant status, your detoxification ability, which includes also your bile flow. Your bile plays a huge part in detoxification. Mm. And then we build off of that. We look at your phase two liver detox pathways, and we can look at your neurotransmitters and we can look at your histamine load. And so there's a lot of different areas, Mm. but because the, the genetic test that I use is so comprehensive, I would you know, the interpretations would take weeks or months for me to go through gene by gene by gene. So that is why I take a meticulous intake saying, okay, what are your top areas of concern? What are the previous diagnoses you've had? What are the previous surgeries you've had? You know, how are your periods? How are your poop? So that way I know where in the software to go and, and look at their genes and make mention of, of the ones that I feel are worth mentioning and likely playing a part in whatever that person has going on. Holy cow. It's so much bigger than I, I mean, I know it's so much bigger than I realize, but it's so much bigger than I realize. It, tell me you're one person, fabulous, but still one person. So you do your own genetic screenings. Like if I wanted to be a patient of yours and I wanted to get that done, I could, what else are you offering? And you have the book, the mm-hmm. book is great. Yeah. Um, what else are you offering so that more people can be served by this instead okay. of putting them down that pathway of IVF? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I also created, um, first off, I have a mini course for its introduction to nutrigenomics and mm-hmm. the functional genomic analysis software. And that's a mini course. It's only $27, but if you're not sure what a genetic variant or a SNP or a mutation or heterozygous or homozygous, all of that stuff, um, it's, it's defined, it's put in layman's terms, but I also have an affiliate program for practitioners that want to offer genetic interpretation, but they don't have the time or the wherewithal to learn a whole nother modality because it is a lot of information. I've been doing this for 10 years. And the more that I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know. And Mm -hmm. so it, it is a lot. But I, there's a lot of misinformation out there. There are some influencers out there talking about their genetic tests that only tests for five genes. And so you can't tell anything based on five genes and, and you don't know what other genes that you might have that could be positively or negatively affecting those genes. And here's the big takeaway, just because you have a genetic variant does not mean that it's expressing. And so that's why I, I pair my genetic interpretations with the intake form and also lab tests. So if people want to have labs done to verify, or if they already have had labs um, with one of my packages, you you can send me your labs and I can incorporate them into my interpretation. But the practitioners, um, it is an affiliate program and I do have a separate link on my website for practitioners to sign up for that. 
I think the great thing, well, my favorite thing about interviewing entrepreneurs for over seven years now is that we get into whatever we get into because of our own story, which is so fascinating to me. And our goal is to make it faster, easier, and more supported for other people. So I love that you're trying to make it faster, easier, and more supported for me, like the person, and also like for the practitioner. And you have several ways that you can help make that happen that actually streamlines things for you and streamlines things for other people. So I'm like supremely proud to know you and Aww. to share this episode. It's just so fantastic. Miscarriage and infertility are two of the many subjects women do not talk about enough. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I went into bereavement as a doula just because we're, we're kind of just told to walk it off, you know, like, sorry about your loss. <laughs> Yes. See next pregnancy. Nobody yes. asks why. And infertility is the same thing. It's this, it's this quiet pain that women carry around. Um, and I think we feel very silenced by by just the way people handle those things. They're grief laden and they're hard conversations to have. And I'm so grateful that you're like shouting this. Like there's there is more. There's something else you can do because the traditional model, like I was just lucky at 20 years old, I was like, nope, not going there, not doing mm -hmm. it. And holy kudos to women who keep plowing through that because it is unbearably emotionally challenging to go through that. It's so hard. So just having another option where you're like, wait, take a beat. We have, there is another way makes me so, I'm just so grateful for it. So thank you. Well, thank you. Wow. That just, uh, helps to really reinforce what I'm doing and, and keep me on the path. If, you know, we all have our days of like, is this yeah. what I should be doing? And should I, <laughs> should I keep doing this? And so, um, I am building my business and I, I do, I want to get the word out there that, Assisted reproductive technologies are not your only option. And there are so many other things you can do and explore. And should you feel the need to even go the route of ART, your body will be so much more responsive because you have gotten rid of toxins that could be inhibiting your fertility. You have repleted nutrient deficiencies because you can't pour from an empty cup, right? So yep. there's there's so many levels and steps to uh getting that baby in your arms. I have one more question just because it's applicable to myself. And okay. so I'm asking a selfish question. What about post-menopause? What, what about it as far as your genes? As far or? as the genetic testing and what can be done, I would think that it would be very parallel to infertility and being able to help women who are post-menopause going through struggles on that end, because it's so much of it is based on your hormone levels and I'm sure everything else that you're testing for. Is it well, possible to do the same process for someone post-menopause? Well, yes, because it, it really comes down to cellular health, right? Your eggs mm -hmm. are cells, sperm are cells. And again, they're the most vulnerable, but as far as menopause goes, it, you know, the, I say the, the cleaner your liver is, the easier you have making that transition. But usually when, when women reach the menopausal stage of life, they're more thinking about longevity, right? And there yes. are, there's actually genes there, your SIRT genes, they're a family of genes, yeah. your CERT genes are known as your longevity genes, plus uh, your antioxidants as well, uh, because your CERT has uh, its fingers in the pots of all your antioxidants as well. Right. So everything's tied together. And so focusing more on cellular health and um, making sure that your cells are able to um, take in nutrients and, and be able to create energy and, you know, get rid of waste um, and just have that cellular resilience is going to improve whatever your situation is. Yeah. I love it. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Jacqueline, for being on. I appreciate your story and what you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me on. I love your energy and I am so glad that you are sharing it with the world. Thank you.